Hello, hello. Hey, Lizzie. Hey, I'm liking your shirt today, Matt. I couldn't actually see it. A picture and, a, and it's all big screen now for me so i'm like oh appreciate it you know i thought you know would rock the purple theme trey's got yeah. a, a purple theme lunio's got a purple theme thought I'm i'd uh, cover it. yes thank you i appreciate being on brand there totally <laughs> hey man hey lizzie <laughs> hey leo hey leo. leo how are you doing you okay i'm good good looking forward to this Yes. Yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm um, just going to check the chat real quick. We've got a few people coming in already. Um, so hi, everybody. Welcome to today's session. Um, really glad to have you here. We've got some people already in the chat. We're having a look around. We'll be in the chat as well. Um, but we're going to have a bit of a QA and a session towards the end. So if you've got any kind of burning questions you want to ask, please feel free to pop them in the Q&A session. Um, my name's Lizzie. I'm one of the customer success managers here at Lunio, and I'll be hosting the conversation today. Uh, we're aiming for around 45 minutes to cover all the points. Uh, and as mentioned, the topic of today's session is how to increase demand um, with less budget through B2B advertising. So I'm going to go ahead and just start sharing this. Here we go. And hopefully everybody can see that and it looks beautiful. Um, specifically, we'll be exploring the value of using paid media to amplify thought leadership, value added content and build brand authority, all of which play a significant role in buyer decision making. We'll also be having a look at things like dark social and word of mouth distribution, um, the different ways automation can drive marketing efficiency, as well as dissecting some really great examples of scroll stopping ads. So to help us with that, we've got Matt today from Trio. Uh, he's the senior performance marketing manager. Matt, you all right today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, it's great. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, we're also joined by Lunio's own Leo. Uh, he's the head of demand generation. How are you doing today, Leo? I'm doing very good. Thanks, Lizzie. Yeah, very good. excited to see uh, some big names coming through. So I think with us, we have Refine Labs, Salesforce, Outreach, and Sales, Lo Sales Loft attending. So really yeah. looking forward to this. Amazing. Yeah, I can see through the chat. We've got some people from all over the world. It's really exciting to see people from Edinburgh, London, Texas. Um, awesome. Great to see everybody here today. Um, so I'm just going to run over a few bits of housekeeping for everybody just before we get to the questions. So we are recording today's session. Um, we'll send it out via um, email afterwards for anybody that wishes to rewatch or just watch on demand. We'll also be creating a written summary as well um, on the Lunio blog with key takeaways from the discussion today and a bit of a TLDR section. So do be on the lookout for that later. Uh, and if, like I said before, if you've got any questions, feel free to either pop them in the chat or we have that specific Q&A section. Uh, we will be going over those at the end of the session today. Um, and we'll also be sending out a few polls during this live session. So I'm actually going to kickstart with the first poll, which is going on the moment, which is who are you backing to win the AI war? I can see people are already kind of voting through there on chat GBT. Um, I feel a bit kind of same. Probably chat GBT would be my answer. I don't know about you guys, um, but it's definitely... Well it's a bit of a nuanced question and answer because <laughs> chat gbt is the protocol that was built by open ai to provide all of these ai responses right so it's a yeah. similar protocol that both microsoft and google and everyone else quite frankly are tapping into it's a matter of how they're applying that protocol uh to do what they want so for google and and microsoft specifically it's for optimizing search or rather it's going to be changing the way that we use search it's going to be real-time results talking back to us instead of just giving us what we're asking for um so it's going to be interesting to see how people uh start incorporating the different use cases and protocol there's actually um, a pretty fun one within tray.io specifically we built out a connector using a gbt protocol so that you can automate responses using gbt so um it's going to be interesting to see uh, who ultimately comes out on top or or comes up with the most interesting use case. Oh, wow. I love that. That's really cool to see just like the evolution of how it's progressing so far as well. is just kind of astonishing uh, at the rate that it is. I so, yeah, totally. Um, but yeah, so just to kind of cover over a little bit on the agenda today, I'm going to do there we go. Um, firstly, we'll be looking at ways um, that marketing departments can drive efficiency with less resources. Um, then we'll talk about the role that automation plays in B2B demand gen. Uh, after that, we'll cover the impact blocking fake ad engagement has on marketing KPIs. Uh, and then we'll look at some examples of great B2B ads and break them down before closing with a roundup of some actionable takeaways that you can focus on to run more efficient campaigns. So 
now that all of that housekeeping is out of the way, I want to just kind of dive straight into the questions. Um, the first question, I'm going to direct straight to that, and then Leo, I'd love to hear your answers afterwards. Um, but really, what ways can marketing drive more efficiency with less resources? Yeah, so the name of the game is always optimization, right? But in today's macroeconomic climate, there are other considerations that have to be taken into account beyond what can I do with the resources I have. Now the question is, what can I do with the resources that I no longer have, right? So a lot of that is about driving even more alignment between or across your entire org. So sales and marketing specifically, the more alignment that you can have there, the better. Um, and it is about eliminating wasted spend, right? It's finding exclusion audiences in your campaigns. It's finding uh, specific to Lunio. Uh, one of the great use cases for us is invalid bot traffic that is just eating up wasted budget, right? So there are some really easy wins that we can have as marketers in order to drive more efficiency, even when we're told, you know, we have to be driving more results, but we don't have the same resources that we had previously to be able to do so. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. I completely resonate with that. Um, Leo, is there anything you'd like to add to this? Uh, Matt was was spot on with that, especially around eliminating wasted spend. Um, so in my opinion, the road to efficiency starts by stopping what doesn't work. So stop spending on activity that doesn't generate um, revenue. And what we've been seeing, aside from uh, lower budgets, ad platforms started increasing their reach and, and targeting is no longer as accurate as it used to be a year, two years ago. So really, if you want to be more efficient, you need to reevaluate the way you're targeting customers and focus on excluding audiences. This isn't just invalid traffic, but try to identify who are the passive audiences versus active audiences. So people in groups, for example, um, and try to prioritize declared intent over assumed intent. So just because a logo looks great in the pipeline um, doesn't mean that they've shown intent. Just because someone's visited your website, again, that's not necessarily uh, a, a purchasing intent signal. Um, prioritizing declared intent looks at, let's say, G2 signals, so specifically product comparisons or views on a pricing page, maybe consecutive views from a particular account. Um, so all, all, all in all, it's shifting your focus on and narrowing, narrowing your focus down on activities that you know are going to to generate an ROI. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I agree 100 percent. And I think also something that's really important is in order to streamline all of those efforts, you need something to be able to help facilitate that. Right. And that is where AI automation all of these streamlined workflows that people are able to build without the use of actual hands-on resources, right? That's It's automation that's then running in the background is really crucial in answering the question of how do we do the same things we were doing before with less budgetary, less headcount, right? There's a lot of different constraints that organizations are having to deal with today. And that I think is also a big reason why we're seeing such a rise so quickly in AI and automation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that perfectly leads me on to my next question. So thank you very much for that. Um, around about kind of what role does automation specifically play in B2B demand gen? And um, what are the ways that kind of you've been using that automation? How has it been benefiting you? Yeah, well, specifically at uh, Trey, we use our own tool to automate internal workflows. So we do everything from lead routing to campaign reporting, uh, to sales enablement, to campaign attribution. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. So there's a lot of different things that we do personally, internally to power Trey using Trey automations. Um, using Lunio specifically, we rely heavily on the AI capabilities to identify and actively exclude IP addresses that we know are invalid, right? That's something that we'd have to do manually before, um, specifically within our Google ad campaigns. So uh, there are a lot of different things that can be done with automation in, in order to streamline. It's a matter of what are the priorities for your business, and then you go through and figure out how to connect the dots from A to B. 
Yeah, great answer. Um, Leo, what would you say that the ways that you've been using automation? Is there anything you can connect with what Matt said there? Have you been using it in a similar way or has it been different for you and your team? Yep, uh, I'll actually mention a recent one, um, a recent discovery of mine, which is we, I mean, we're, we're suffering from tech fatigue, right? Like we're dealing with so many different platforms and we're trying to centralize data uh, in, in a particular platform, but we still have at least maybe four different platforms reporting on either leads or intent signals, whatever that might be. Um, so centralizing all of that information into a single communication channel. So for instance, for that, for us, that would be Slack. Um, a great example is we have automation so that anyone who engages with or registers the webinar goes into Slack. Um, anyone who signs up, again, Slack notification, G2 activity, Slack notification. Um, this isn't just this doesn't just give, give us an overview, but an overview to the company or any department that should be involved in that system. So it just makes the company a lot more efficient at handling that data. Um, the the other piece, which is also quite um, I guess quite uh, quite a modern technique, is capturing abandoned form submissions or at least automating part of that. So we can actually tell how many people skip the, the um, filling in the second step of a form or start filling in a form and drop it off. Uh, we have uh, alerts and signals that come through when that happens. We can still collect some of that data in a GDPR uh, safe way. But again, it's trying to make the most, collect as much data as possible, and then again, automate that into a central system. Uh, whether that be leads or any kind of intent activity. Yeah, great answer. And and what would you kind of say could be the potential risks with you to utilizing automation in this way? There's definitely a risk to over automate, right? There's you can have so many workflows running that are reliant on each other that when one breaks it, it causes problems down the chain, right? Which is why it's really important to make sure that you set up these prop processes really, really uh, uh, streamlined at the beginning of your setup process so that down the line you don't run into those types of issues. Um, but the flip side is really the, the sky is the limit, right? There's so much potential for what you can do with automation. You have to really silo down and, and prioritize, okay, what is feasible and also what is top of mind for the business and how that plays into what Leo said, which is your current tech stack, right? That's the big, big question mark is every organization has a different puzzle and it's how do you get the pieces within that puzzle to work harmoniously together? And usually more often than not is automation. Yeah, great. Le Leo, is there anything you'd like to just add to that point? I was about to say, Matt, Matt is the automation expert, but to <laughs> add, we have experienced the same issues, especially with um, chains of automation. So if you have a chain of automation, so let's say you're automating a process that then has a second, third step, fourth step, that just leaves more room for error. Um, to add to the previous question, actually, one of the recent automations we set up is leveraging LinkedIn audiences. So syncing intense signals into LinkedIn audiences so that we can then retarget the right companies. Um, again, it's just a one-to-one a -one sync, whereas previously when we tested it out with Google Sheets or maybe two or three steps in between, that would often lead to failure, at least at some point, especially as if, if, if you're a startup and you're scaling a company, and then processes are going to change, and then those automated processes will fail at some point. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. So we talked about kind of um, automation being a heavy side of it um, in terms of improving that. What would you kind of say, obviously, Lunio has had that impact as well from your reducing that invalid traffic. Matt, really, what has been your kind of successes with this? Has it impacted your marketing metrics in a, in a large way? What's that been around? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the biggest result is, I think, right there. And in this case, red is good, right? Red uh, here is showing how many invalid users at Lunio was able to identify for us uh, month over month since we adopted last year. Uh, $73,000 worth of invalid click traffic that we were able to reallocate into active valid traffic, right? And, you know, you see the results at the bottom. Um, that, it, I think, is the epitome of what we're talking about today. 
Um, we were not immune to the macroeconomic climate. We, like everyone else, were told to deliver the same, if not more, results with less budget. Um, and so we expected those top of metric, top of funnel metrics to fall, as you can see, month, uh, year over year. But that bounce rate, pages per session, and the overall goal conversion rate um, is showing us that the, despite the lowered traffic, which is again a expected correlation to the lowered spend, we're getting higher quality traffic, people who are more likely to be leads that we want, people who are more likely to be valid retargeting audiences for us, and people who ultimately end up converting into quality leads. Um, so it's been a huge lift for us metrics-wise since adoption, and it's an easy win for any marketers on the call if you're looking for a way to demonstrate uh, return on investment. Uh, you know, it, the results really have spoken for themselves, at least for us. That's amazing to hear. It's always great to hear that. Um, Leo, what other benefits have you seen um, among Lunio clients? So l let me just add to uh, Matt's slide there. I'm actually a big fan of some of the vanity metrics there, or what some marketers consider vanity metrics, which are the bounce rates and the pages per session. Um, so the reason why I'm mentioning that is across clients, we've seen this being quite a consistent figure on top of a reduction in costs and an increase in conversions. But then when you start seeing that actual behavior on your website changing, that is a clear indication that there is something wrong with the traffic that you're driving through advertising. Um, so to answer your question, reduction in bounce rates, um, that has been a big one for us. Um, pages per session, I think specifically the conversion rates and costs per acquisition decreasing. So conversion rates increasing, CPA is decreasing. Um, I know we've had one client who was advertising on Performance Max and they managed to slash their um, cost by around 40%. Um, no change in conversion count. And that's a 40% reduction in cost, which is ridiculous. It just goes to show that there is something clearly broken in the ad system. Um, and every advertising platform is going to work differently. Um, but I will mention that video and display specifically, definitely watch out for that. And for anyone advertising on Performance Max where you don't have control, as a B2B company, you don't have control over video and display ad spend. Um, yeah, I, I'd look to consider how much budget you're, you're reallocating onto that, make use of offline conversion tracking. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. And I love the kind of use there that Matt, that you said that red is good. It's so kind of rare to, to see that in a, in a marketing perspective, at least that actually, you know, that decrease there is, is a good thing because it shows that it's there and it's working in the background. Um, yep. So that's really great. Um, there, so is, I, there is actually one, oh, yeah. one piece there that um, I know, I know we've not, we've not discussed, but uh, we'll be good to cover it at a later stage, which is, we, we know that, um, or for those familiar with Lunio, knows that Lunio um, works with IP addresses on, let's say, Google search. Uh, but for the majority of our exclusions, we work, we, we actually use audiences. And I guess the interesting bit is when you look at social media audiences, fake audiences. So what we can do is we can actually build a fake audience on LinkedIn to now determine from the traffic that you've been driving how many of those are fake visits, but then look at their demographics and try to understand a little bit more their behavior. And I think that is super interesting because then you start seeing maybe certain companies pop up or a certain job function that is being picked up as an invalid traffic signal. And you can just be proactive at excluding those. Or sometimes location, we see, you know, a lot will come from a specific location and that's, you know, the result of a click farm, most likely. Um, that's been really useful for us is to be able to see proportionally how many are coming from country A versus country B, um, and then be able to add those metrics into our exclusion audiences, to your point, has been uh, a huge win for us as well. Yeah, it's that granular level of information that you can get that gives you back that sense of con that control, right? Definitely. And um, I think the important thing here and how it ties into what we're talking about today is like that wasn't a mystery or unavailable to us before it's the tools and the processes weren't available to us. We had to do all of this manually, right? So it was usually pushed down the line because there were other things that took priority. Now, because of AI and automation, we can rely on those workflows to be able to do these things for us in the background. And then one up that 
use that data and leverage it to optimize what we're trying to do today. Yeah, definitely. And just kind of on that, Matt, how would you say that you found the kind of setup process for putting these uh, in place? It's pretty streamlined. Um, I mean, once you have it, it's the ideal definition of automation. It goes, it runs, it does what it's supposed to in the background, and it lets you know the results after the fact. Um, and so it gives you a lot of proactive information to be able to act on. It lets you kind of, I don't want to say relax, but it gives you peace of mind knowing that you don't have to go in and constantly be checking these audiences, checking to see how much wasted spend you have. Um, you can just go and do what you are trying to focus on, which is build as opposed to figure out what's broken. Uh, so I think that's really been the biggest impact for us. Amazing. Leo, is there anything else you want to add there? Um, on, on the setup process, so having, having set this up on, on our own accounts, so we do use our own product, um, I'd say exactly the same. I think the ease to use is probably my favorite function. Um, you know, I don't want this to be another platform that I'm managing. I just want it to do what it's supposed to do um, and not having to constantly look at it and, and, and tweak any settings. So love that about it. Um, and then I guess the automated process around generating these audiences, again, fully automatic. Um, I'd say these, those, those are probably my two favorite components. Great. Thank you. Um, so Matt, you've kindly, and Leo as well, you've kindly gone away and got some few different uh, example ads here. So I'd love if you could just go through each one and just tell them what made them so effective. Yeah, absolutely. So um, first thing is we have recently rebranded or had a slight rebranding. So just some updated color schemes, some updated messaging, um, really highlighting the fact that our solution offers a respite for people, right? We aren't trying to fix tech. We are trying to help people solve problems. That's the message that we have. And so really leaning on that messaging and putting a people first, customer first approach has yielded some really interesting results for us. Um, we've incorporated all of that into the ads that you see on the left in the way of the, the new messaging, loving your work, automating everything else, giving some very clear product screenshots and so that you can see what to expect if you are going to click through to see and learn more and potentially sign up for a demo. Um, the ad in the middle specifically is taking advantage of a new type of ad format. So, you know, when you're being told to cut down on budget or when you're being told to do less with the same resources that you have uh, or do the same with less resources rather. Um, one of the good things to do is change up variants and do A-B testing. And so taking advantage of a new format like the vertical ad format in the middle that LinkedIn has launched, which specifically only shows on mobile and takes up the entire screen when they're scrolling, really stops the scroll, um, has been an effective tactic for, tactic for us. Um, one of my favorite ads that we've been running is in the top right, uh, just basic text ads. And the, the goal is top of funnel brand awareness. Uh, just have a nice day with an emoji to catch your, your eye um, and really calling out what we're doing. No marketing jargon, just a friendly hello from trade.io uh, and want you to have a great day. We think that it's important to get eyes on our ads in different ways, right? That are still on brand and align with our messaging, but stand out of the crowd, right? That's another way that you can win is if you're doing the same thing as everything else, you're going to blend as everyone else, you're going to blend it. So doing something different that helps you stand out from the crowd can yield some interesting results. And we do have some more traditional automate with trade.io, see how you can streamline your workflow processes, et cetera, messaging running against these ads. And funny enough, these are the ads that are performing the best, the ones that are talking to people like they're people. Um, and just again, speaking to the ability for our platform to connect to a bunch of different tools and software. Um, we try and highlight that whenever we can. And so that's an example on the bottom right. It's actually a, um, an animated ad that I know we weren't able to show a, a, a running ad, but it actually animates and shows a bunch of different specific tools like Salesforce, like uh, Monday.com, like Asana, like 
Tableau, like Slack, that will cycle through and then we can go through and target people actively um, in technographic audiences, say, you know, we know people who are using Slack, who are using Salesforce, who's using Sana and serve them these ads proactively. Yeah, perfect. Um, they're really, really cool. I like those. Um, Leo, I know you've got some as well. So I'm just going to go into the next slide and you can talk us through those. I was about to say, watch, watch everyone uh, jump on text ads after the session. I'm going to keep an eye out on LinkedIn to see if, if we can kind of correlate the activity there. Um, OK, I'll, I'll quickly go, th go through mine. I've just included a few examples. And you know what? It was quite difficult narrowing the list down. So, um, I mean, if you're in marketing, you're probably constantly screenshotting, bookmarking ads, et cetera. I have a list of maybe over a thousand different ads. And it's crazy to see how in the past two years, how advertising has changed specifically on LinkedIn. So two years ago, it was like going through a newspaper where you see these kind of obvious product ads. And now you have these ads kind of blending into the, uh, to your social media feed. Uh, and being quite disruptive as well. So not always about a specific product, but maybe it's a meme, maybe it's a valuable piece of content. And I guess this is, the first example is is Gong um, on, on the previous slide. And Gong really leads with uh, a value added approach. So I'm not in sales, but I feel like I've learned quite a lot about sales, just seeing Gong ads, um, especially around the landscape in 2023. Um, not to be biased, we've included uh, ours in as well. This is our, one of our most, um, w one of our ads with the most engagement. And uh, what, we've, what we were trying to do is trying to humanize the brand a little bit. And I think a lot of brands try to do this, but they, do, they don't do it well, uh, which is combining it with social proof, but telling a story as well. So what we've done was we've actually included a carousel of, um, of, of social proofs and, and quotes that really stand out and resonate with the end user. Um, and then a third one, which is something that's actually creeping up as one of the more relevant points in today's age is making sure that your message resonates with the end user. So this is a great example from Cognizm that I've taken uh, off, off my phone um, on Instagram. And I thought that was great because again, not in sales, but the message there hit me straight on. I immediately knew what they were offering. Um, it just resonated with me. So that's not to say that you know you shouldn't stop doing product ads or demo ads, but making sure that if you're confident in the person that you're targeting, make sure that message doesn't just help the company, but help the individual do their work better. So that's it for the, the first set of three. Yeah, sorry, I got a bit trigger happy with uh, clicking through the slide there for the next one. I was too excited about the Simpsons meme. <laughs> oh, no worries, no worries. Well, this one, this section is, is a bit more disruptive. Um, I'll actually start with the Simpsons meme because I thought this was quite funny. Um, so those, those in the demand community, metadata uh, demand community, have probably seen this. Dream data, uh, Dream data strategy is probably like 50% memes or something, or at least on my feed. Every, every time I come across a sales slash marketing meme, um, quite often that is a dream data ad. And the reason why I think these work really well is that you can now filter through passive LinkedIn users versus active users. So you're now measuring everyone that comments, everyone that likes and tags a person, and you can identify, okay, out of this account that I'm going after, who's the right individual that I should be speaking to? And I think that this is often a challenge uh, in, in the sales side, which is you have an account list, you know the people on LinkedIn, but that doesn't mean they're active. Even if they're sharing, that doesn't mean that they're the type of people that would comment, engage, reply back. So that kind of helps narrow down the list. Um, gift cards. So we're probably in the era of gift cards at this point. Um, I, I feel like every time I open LinkedIn, there's a gift card by some company. I think recently Mutiny are offering a $200 gift card. So who knows, maybe end of the year, we'll see a $500 gift card come out. But I guess what brands are, are realizing is that you can actually uh, increase the amount that you're incentivizing users to sign up for a demo or a trial, and that still reduces your overall cost per acquisition. Um, metadata do this really well with their retargeting ads purely because if you're looking at the solution and you're still evaluating whether they are the right choice, a $100 gift card is going to get you 
um, across the line, at least for an initial call. And then playing their cards right, they can establish that relationship. Um, and then the, the third one, the third one is a must for anyone advertising on LinkedIn. You need to jump on this, which is in-mails. So in-mails are super cheap. They're 50p per in-mail. Um, if you, again, if you have the right audience with the right message, um, you're looking at a cost per acquisition. And this is, let's say, top of the funnel. So we're looking at webinar registrations, um, $20 per registration. Now, keep in mind that the average cost per click on LinkedIn for sponsored ads is well over $10. So you could be spending $10, $20. Um, so this is an example of an ad campaign that we ran for Performance Max, which is a trending topic. Um, we've included a, a few influences there, and we're seeing a cost per acquisition of $12 per lead, um, most of those with business email addresses and mostly in the mid-market enterprise segment. So again, there, there are some restrictions around running these in Europe, um, but this is specifically the conversational ad. So someone can engage with you and you can reply to them automatically on LinkedIn. It's not just a one way street where you engage with something, you don't hear a response back. So you can build some very interesting conversation flows from the back of it. Oh, amazing. Matt, would you like to add anything just to those, um, to Leo's points there? Yeah, I love the creativity. Uh, I, I saw someone in the chat say, you know, that's a big part of my feed, that Lunio carousel ad. Uh, you know, it's it's effective for a reason, right? Um, also, to Leo's point, the in-mails are a great tool, especially when you have a very targeted audience, right? When you have a one-to-one -one message that's going to potentially resonate with who you're trying to talk to, the best way to reach them is with a conversation or an in-mail. And, and try and speak to them in terms that they understand, right? So I love the creativity. I love the variant, uh, the variance that we have in, in terms of from meme to text. And uh, I think that there's a lot of potential. It's, it's just about finding what works best for your brand and, and message. And I think it, the, all of the different examples we have here are, are a good reflection of that. Great, thank you very much. Um, perfect, so thank you for sharing those examples. Um, they're really, really helpful and give us some great insight. So lastly, I just kind of want to cover the last question. Um, what are some tangible takeaways that viewers can um, take away to run a more efficient campaigns? Yeah, so there are a, a lot of easy wins. Um, you know, right off the bat, using the right tools and and what we've been talking about today how we've gotten easy wins from lunio how we've gotten easy wins from trey leaning on ai and automation to streamline processes that we normally would have to have done manually before um that's an easy win so it's about going through and if you're asking for a tangible takeaway what can i as marketer as a gtm professional go and do to make an impact on my org that i'm not doing already is go and make a list of every process that you have to do manually that could potentially be automated. Prioritize it in terms of what is going to have the biggest impact to your business from A to Z, and then work with your ops team and figure out how you can streamline those prioritized processes. And you will be shocked at how much more efficient and how much better results you'll be able to drive when you aren't focusing on manual everyday things that you would have to have normally been doing. Um, another thing is what we were just talking on is figuring out how to touch into personalization, into creativity, into doing something that stands out from the crowd, right? You're going to always be running ads, even if you're told that you have less resources to be able to do so. The key is always finding the right mix and what message resonates with your audience. And you're always going to have to be doing A-B testing. Um, so really changing things up, trying new things. Um, marketing is gambling at the end of the day. Like if you show me a marketer who says they know which ad is going to perform best before they launch a campaign, I'll show you a liar. Um, it's, it's really about trying to find uh, what's working and you have to use the tools again and the metrics that you have in place today to make informed business decisions to move forward. Um, a really important tactic that we're leaning on specifically is ABM. So we know who our target accounts are. We know what they look like. We know what the roles at these target accounts do. 
and specifically the problems that we can solve for them. And so we want to double down on getting that messaging in front of those target accounts and really spending valuable dollars on the accounts that we think are more likely to impact the end line for our business. So if ABM is something that you're on the fence about, definitely is a tangible takeaway is something you can go and do today um, to up level your audience targeting and your overall marketing efforts. On that same vein, exclusion audiences. Oftentimes, you have a better idea of who your audience isn't than who your audience is, right? So going through and building out exclusion audiences or leveraging tools like Lunio to help them build, build them for you, super, super important and a, and a definite tangible takeaway that you can have uh, to generate impact today. Um, lastly, I would say um, social selling. Right. It's something that everyone can do. Content creation on LinkedIn is completely free. Um, we are going to be able to not only uh, leverage this specific webinar, but we can then go offline, leverage it on demand. We can put it into clips and repurpose that content. We can now repurpose it as a blog. There's a whole bunch of free content that we can now get out of this one 45 minute session that's gonna impact both of our businesses, right? So there are a lot of things that you can do with your personal brand that come in the way of social selling that tie into your business's objectives and can be highlighted as easy wins uh, for both you and your business. So I think those are hopefully a few helpful takeaways that um, people listening can go and try and execute today. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much. Leo, would you like to add anything onto that? Oh, that, that was a great list, Matt. Um, I guess I'll, I'll highlight the uh, the creator economy that we're in. Again, it's free to be creating content, to be posting um, on social platforms. Social selling plays a big role, but also tapping into communities, understanding what your audience wants, but also how, how do they think? Like how, how do they phrase sentences, for example? Just being there plays a significant role in terms of understanding what they want and what they're interested in. It's not just a persona research survey that you can run. You actually need to be part of these communities and understanding the language they're using. Um, so aside from that, I guess doing less, but doing it very, very well, um, except for ABM where you have to do more and very well at the same time. Um, touching on ABM first, so specifically one-to-one -one ABM campaigns. Um, I still think there's a lot of room for one-to-many, and I think most ABM is still done at one-to-many. Uh, but the ones that really shine are when you do a one-to-one -one ABM campaign and you call out specific companies. So Loom do this very well. Um, I've seen that Treio also has similar ads where you just include a company's logo, but have that content speak directly to them um, if anything, you could even have a landing page dedicated to that account if you're that serious about uh, converting or ca ca capturing the, um, the, the account's attention. Uh, chat GPT and AI, I mean, that can't miss that one. Use that on a daily basis, uh, but use that purely for research. So it, it, in, in terms of doing, more, doing less, but doing it very well, Next time you're working on some kind of campaign, whether that is a guide, a webinar, whatever that might be, ChatGPT is great when you're inputting titles, ideas, and you're asking it to rewrite and, and, and rethink, re reshape uh, the, the format. And then you end up with a condensed list of valuable takeaways based on the information you've inputted. Um, so that compared to researching on Google, which is very time consuming, is, is a game changer. So it's like go to ChatGPT and coming up with some great strategies, and then it's just outputting all these great ideas that I can kind of, kind of combine and craft something of my own. So definitely make sure you're leveraging that. Um, so other ones, I guess, reevaluating your targeting. Mentioned that earlier, um, but we are in the era of exclusion, folks. So please, please make sure you're excluding um, uh, audiences. If you're not, definitely recheck your, your targeting. There's always someone to exclude, uh, whether it's a job title, whether it's narrowing your targeting by groups. Um, in fact, I would, I would challenge people in the community to run this test if they haven't already, which is on specifically on LinkedIn. You can run an A-B test and compare a, a community that is part of 
specific groups versus not being part of those groups. And you'll find out that actually, you know, fake accounts have something in common. They're not part of specific groups. Um, sometimes they don't add skills to their profiles. Just make sure you're adding things that would mimic an active user uh, on LinkedIn. And uh, I guess that the last bit is focusing on what works and getting off the, the marketing rat wheel. So there's this saying that marketers <clears throat> wear a hundred different hats and we're always doing so many things at once. I mean, we feel it in Lunio, um, but you have to take it easy sometimes and, and kind of reevaluate what you're doing and ask yourself, is it worth continuing with this activity? Is it clear that it's generating pipeline? Is it clear that the, that the output is helping the business? So great examples include, you know, posting uh, maybe five blogs a week or maybe sending out five emails a week just because every other company does it. I've seen companies that have trimmed down their email marketing strategies to one email a month and, and kept it to a very condensed, valuable newsletter. And people still talk about that newsletter. Um, so definitely narrowing down and, and focusing on, on what works for you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Matt. I don't know if there's anything you want to add on just to that before we kind of go to a bit of a Q&A session. No, I think that covers it. Cool. Perfect. Thank you very much for those. Um, so we do have just a few minutes to the end now just to kind of answer a couple of questions here that people have put in. So I'm just going to kind of start off with a few that have come through. Um, Matt, there's one particular that you'll probably be best to answer this one. So I'm going to start with this one first. Um, what patterns or tips have you noticed in B2B advertising in the US market? Uh, definitely uh, that ABM shift. I'm seeing more and more, not only ABM strategies, but ABM specific roles that are coming up, right? A head of ABM marketing, ABM strategy type roles. That's definitely something that people are putting uh, an emphasis on. Um, I, I think also, unfortunately, we're starting to see a rise in AI and chat GBT generated content and ad campaigns. Um, I've seen a couple of companies try and utilize this. I've only seen one do it effectively. Um, I think we're going to see more of that pop up as the tools uh, evolve. Um, yeah, Leo, what have you seen, if anything? Uh, rise of communities. I mean, this is everywhere, but mostly in the US. It seems that every company wants to have their own community. Um, I mean, yeah, give you a heads up. We're also looking into that. And um, I mean, that's not to say that every company needs a community, but you do need to be part of those communities where important conversations are being held. So a great example actually was um, the first time I joined uh, Demand, uh, the Demand community by Metadata. Um, the first time I joined on that same day, someone mentioned Lunio uh, against a competitor. I was like, I don't know if you remember that, Matt. I think you were already in the chat, I was like, what are the chances? No way. So imagine that happening in channels that you just can't measure. You, you just don't know what's going on. And I think communities help have a little bit more control and visibility over those conversations. Yeah, that's a great, great point. And also another role that we're seeing pop up more, right? Head of community, community engagement. It's a specific role. It doesn't just sit within the whole marketing org anymore. There are people who are dedicating their entire days to facilitating community conversations that are driving real results for their business, for people in the community, for uh, a lot of different uh, uh, people involved. Um, I think also in that same vein and to potentially wrap up this question, it, we're seeing a rise in companies who are putting an emphasis on employees having personal brands and employees who are able to leverage social selling effectively. Um, that is something I think we're definitely seeing more and more uh, uh, companies try and utilize in, in this year and will not likely be slowing down anytime soon. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I would ask some more questions, but I think unfortunately we're running out of time. Um, so thank you for people asking questions. We will make sure that we get, get a response back to you on those. Um, so big thank you for everybody to join us today. Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Um, would you like people know if they want to connect with you, where they can connect with you, and if there's anything else you want to mention before we wrap up? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, would love to connect with you on LinkedIn, uh, linkedin.com slash in slash Matt-Atkin, or you can just search Matt-Atkin. 
Um, I'm there uh, smiling at you with the uh, trade.io banner. Uh, happy to help you with any of your marketing and or automation questions or just to connect and, and say hi. Perfect. And Leo, likewise, if there's anything you want to add or how people can connect with you. Uh, well, I mean, the best way to connect with me is probably by signing up for a demo and then you'll be getting my, my emails every week. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm only kidding. You can find me. I mean, obviously, aside from that, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, send me a connection or, or give me a follow. I mean, I do try to share some helpful content every week, uh, not just around marketing, but AI um, trending topics, uh, just sharing a, a slightly different perspective into what's happening. Perfect. Thank you very much. And if anybody felt like they didn't get their questions answered, you can reach us uh, directly at hello at Um We'll be happy to kind of answer any questions you've got there via email as well. So thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. Thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you again at another one of the future webinars. Thanks, all. All right. Thanks very much. Take care. See ya.